is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and recriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, tokers and tokets, and welcome. It is Monday, January 23rd, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome back to the weekend, although I guess it could just as well be 2007, considering who's in the Super Bowl. Haven't we seen this one already? New York Giants come back out of nowhere to be the number six seed to get into the playoffs on the road in overtime. They win by a field goal to face the number one seed out of the AFC, the New England Patriots. Haven't we seen this game already? I want a do over. <laughs> All right, let's go to our virtual studio where waiting in the wings is our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey. Hi, Carey. Hi, and I can't even imagine who do you think should have gone to the Super Bowl. I don't even know. You know, if if uh, if this were the BCS, <laughs> if this were college football, the Giants wouldn't have even been bowl eligible. <laughs> it would have been the Packers and the Patriots in the BCS Bowl. But anyway, hey, that's uh, that's football. we got to get to some marijuana news. There's plenty of news uh, today. So, Carrie, There's tell other us. fans we should uh, offend. And <laughs> that, 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 that's <laughs> right. Giant fans. Anyway, we do have a lot of news today uh, being a Monday. You know, I think, Russ, that this year it's going to be interesting to count. There will probably be less states that don't have marijuana uh questions on their ballot than do. It's kind of mm-hmm. going to be interesting. But there is a state that's considering um, an impact on legalization study. We're going to talk about that. Also, we're going to go up to Montana. You know, the news out of Montana has been rough all year. And we're going to tell you about a recent court deci- or a court decision to dismiss some lawsuits. Not more bad news. I'm going to say mm-hmm. that right there. Yeah. But also a Supreme Court decision that's some good news I can tell you about today that came down this morning. And we have sort of a celebrity bust. One of our favorite lawmakers got in <laughs> trouble again. We're going to tell you all about that coming up on the Hemp Headlines. Yes, the schadenfreude is in the air. Whew, can you smell it? Oh, it's going to be a good one today. All right. Also on today's show, it's Roots Monday for our Daily Toker Tunes. And I've got one from the Reefer Jazz Vaults for you today. A uh, real good song called uh, Reefer Blue Reefer. Uh, Blue Reefer Blues. That's it. <laughs> Blue Reefer Blues. I knew there was blue in there somewhere. Also on today's show, uh, two great interviews. Our first interview is with Dr. Michael Reznicek, MD. He's the author of a new book called Blowing Smoke, Rethinking the War on Drugs Without prohibition and rehab, something that's going to be near and dear to my heart. We'll talk to him at half past. And then a 45 past joining us at what will be 545 in the morning his time, Emil Visser from Normal South Africa talking about the second annual Normal Road Show in South Africa and all the activism work he's doing down there uh, to end marijuana prohibition on that continent. So be talking to Emil at 45 after. And then in the second hour, taking your calls at 971-533-7111. Stick around. It's Normal Show Live. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. 
Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from stealth-products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Ella Peeps. Stealth-products.com. Stealth-products.com. What's up, guys? This is Miss High Times 2007, and you're chilling with us here at the Normal Podcast. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds, you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. State Representative Robert Watson has made our headline news yet again. The Republican former House leader in Rhode Island was arrested on Sunday in a similar incident that lost him his House leader position nine months ago. Losing the House leader position was his only sanction, though. He did get to keep his job in committee positions. That may change, though. On Sunday morning, a snowplow driver called the police to say an erratic driver was in the parking lot he was working on. When officers arrived at the scene, they found Representative Watson's Volvo stuck in deep snow, and it was missing seeing the left front tire. Watson was standing outside of his car when officers arrived at the scene. They asked him to wait in his vehicle just so he could stay warm. And then an officer observed Representative Watson pick up an open can of beer once he was back in the car. According to police reports of the incident, the state representative handed over the can reluctantly to the police when they asked for it, adding, do you know who I am? I'm the East Greenwich rep. Also on the report, Watson cursed out the police officers on scene and appeared to be highly intoxicated. When they looked in his car, they found two additional unopened bottles of beer and a pipe with recently burnt marijuana. State Representative Watson was not available for comment today because he has checked himself into an inpatient rehabilitation facility. State GOP Chairman Mark Zacharias said that the decision to seek treatment is a positive sign and shows that he has a medical problem and that they are going to leave the decision up to Representative Watson on whether he can continue to serve the General Assembly of Rhode Island, saying if there are going to be a decision to resign, then it's his to make. Watson (laughs) is already awaiting trial related to an incident that we reported to you back in April. Then he was charged with marijuana possession, possession of drug paraphernalia, and driving under the influence. At the time, his defense was that he only had a few drinks, he wasn't drunk, and that he did, in fact, use the marijuana to treat pain from a reoccurring bout of pancreatitis and that he never sought a medical marijuana recommendation because he wanted to keep the matter private. He also alleged that the Connecticut police targeted him, because it was in Connecticut at the, th- at the time, and then adopted a more aggressive attitude once they saw his legislative ID. And indeed, tests later came back that his blood alcohol level was 0.07, just below the state's 0.08 limit, but also that blood test showed positive for marijuana and cocaine. Also, I want to point out it was just less than a year ago that Representative Watson made headlines when he told the Chamber of Commerce in Providence that the state lawmakers only had their priorities right if you are a Guatemalan gay man who likes to gamble and smoke marijuana. What a difference a year can make. Uh, yeah, what a difference. Here. Well, first of all, you know, of course, going into the rehab, that's the typical, oh, I've been busted. Now I can't get away with this one. I have to go to rehab now. Uh, We'll talk more about that with Dr. Reznicek as we uh, get into the second half hour here. You know, uh, Representative Watson made my uh, top stupid stoner stories of 2011. It looks like he's trying to make the list for 2012 as well. Uh, I I just want to talk about the reporting on this uh, that's kind of interesting to me. As I did the update on this, uh, WPRO AM 630 News Talk uh, in Providence talked about this, and they said when Officer Trevor Richmond arrived, Uh, The officers approached Watson inside the vehicle and found with him uh, a beer can in hand. 
Okay, so the guy's in his car with an open beer in his hand. Officer McRae asked Watson to hand over the natural ice beer can, so shitty beer at that, and exit the vehicle. Uh, Watson was reluctant to obey the officer, saying, do you know who I am? I'm the EG rep. Uh, the police report says Watson appeared to be highly intoxicated, was slurring his words when he stumbled from the vehicle. That's when they saw the pipe on the driver's side floor. Uh, the officer escorted Watson to the cruiser. Uh, Watson replied with, uh, fuck you, whatever, 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 fuck you. <laughs> okay, so first of all, imagine that's you or me. Uh, getting busted for the second time in a DUI situation, addressing a cop like that, do you think that uh, our boss would be saying, well, it's up to you whether you retire. It's up to you whether you think you can continue to do your job. Uh, here at the Assembly, I guess Rhode Island General Assembly is not as strict as, say, a Taco Bell as far as what they would consider to be uh, uh, something to get you uh, lose your job. But anyway, uh, let me go to the other media report on this, because this is really, really telling. Uh, the NBC station, the, the NBC affiliate in Providence, Rhode Island, reported it this way. Rhode Island State Representative Robert Watson has checked into an inpatient rehabilitation program following his second arrest on marijuana possession charges. State GOP Chairman Mark Zakaria said Watson's decision to enter a rehab program shows he's taking steps to address his problem. Police said a snowplow operator reported Watson was driving erratically on a flat tire late Saturday night. Police said they found a pipe used to smoke marijuana and suspected marijuana. Not a single mention in the NBC story about this representative being drunk and being caught with an open can of beer. No, no, must be the marijuana problem that's forced him into rehab. And also... We have a story out of Virginia. A proposal by a Virginia lawmaker would fund a study into the potential revenue stream of marijuana if it were sold in liquor stores. Democratic Virginian delegate David England has also filed a resolution with the governor to petition the DEA to change the scheduling of marijuana, a move that some governors have already made. England would like Virginia to consider the impact of Virginia's 330 liquor stores, joining the growing list of recommendations across the nation to reform the drug laws concerning the most commonly used illegal substance in the U.S., he would like to see Virginia bring in more money revenues for the state so they don't have to cut funding for core services across cash-strapped Virginia. England, who says he has not and is not a marijuana user, says that everyone knows that there are respectable members of society secretly smoking marijuana and giving all that money to criminals. He would like to see that money go into the Commonwealth instead. Under his proposed resolution, eight members of the Virginia General Assembly would head a study on the practicality and feasibility of legalizing the use and sale of marijuana under strict conditions through the Virginia Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. The findings would be due to the legislature for consideration on the first day of the 2013 legislative session. But even though all the feedback that England has received from fellow legislators and constituents, he doesn't actually expect the proposal to survive the House Rules Committee. He does think that the proposals like this face a steep hill to climb, and he wants to take the first few steps and get this conversation going. We told you about Republican Delegate Harvey Morgan a few years back introducing a decrim bill to the House and was mocked and laughed at. The 81-year-old lawmaker had been serving the delegation since 1980. Um, Delegate Morgan has also tried unsuccessfully to broaden the never-used 1970s Virginia law that allows medical marijuana for cancer and glaucoma. Now, we will let you know if this proposal study makes it out of the Rules Committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Virginia is one of those states that has uh, an impotent medical marijuana law. It was passed in the 70s, back when we were first learning about the properties of, of cannabis medicine for glaucoma, for cancer, and so on. Uh, and the problem with these laws, and a few states still have them, is they say the word prescription in them. Because it says prescription, well, that's under federal purview, that's under the DEA, nobody's going to prescribe it, and, and that's why those laws don't work in places like Virginia. Uh, however, as far as Delegate England here uh, proposing the study of marijuana legalization, you know, kudos to him. Thank you very much for, for doing that, because uh, that's, uh, that's huge for our, our issue. We're going to uh, try to get represent, uh, Delegate England on our show to interview about this, so we'll keep you posted when he comes on. And a judge on Friday ruled that Montana's medical marijuana law does not protect those that provide medical marijuana to others from federal prosecution. In the continuing assault, U.S. District Judge Donald Malote, dis uh, Malloy dismissed a civil lawsuit in Montana on Friday that was filed by 14 individuals and businesses that were part of more than 
two dozen medical marijuana providers that were raided in March of last year in a coordinated effort between state and federal agents. The providers were saying their constitutional rights were violated because state law allows them to grow and produce cannabis for medical consumption. Judge Malloy ruled that on that old age, a state's right versus federal government rights. Malloy said that the U.S. Constitution's Supremacy Clause applies in medical marijuana cases because the pre- pre- Supremacy Clause says that federal law prevails if there is any conflict between state and federal statutes. His ruling said, quote, whether the plaintiff's conduct was legal under Montana law is of little significance here. Since the alleged conduct clearly violates federal law, we are bound by federal law, like it or not, unquote. Montana's medical marijuana activists have had a rough year with blow after blow to their medical marijuana industry in the state. A strict new medical marijuana law was put into place by legislators last summer, severely limiting the number of patients that will enroll in the program and putting pressure on medical marijuana businesses like clinics and dispensaries. The legislative action is currently under a legal review View, and there will also be a question about the new law already in effect that will appear on the November ballot for voters to endorse or reject. Some of that new law was temporarily blocked by a state judge, but even with some of the legislation blocked, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of patients and providers who are enrolled in the program. Now, at the end of May, before the legislation took effect, there were 31,522 patients registered with the program. And according to the State Department of Public Health and Human Services that oversees that registration, there are only 18,012 registered patients as of December. In May, there were 4,650 registered providers. Now, last month, 395. The attorney representing the medical marijuana providers in the civil case dismissed on Friday said the ruling is a clear warning to other medical marijuana providers in the state that the federal government can go after them if they want to. He also said that he and his clients have not decided if they will appeal the decision. We are going to continue to get these kind of decisions, though, as long as the federal prohibition exists. And I know people fighting for medical marijuana point to their state constitution that they've got it in or the state law. And how many times are these cases have to come back where they say the state law doesn't mean anything? The federal government supremacy clause is, is in effect here. The rage decisions in effect here. How many times is that going to have to happen before medical marijuana supporters start to realize they've got to put some energy into the fight for legal legalization for everyone? or this is never going to change. And a very important privacy ruling came down for the Supreme Court today. The highest justices ruled that police cannot put a GPS tracking device on your car to track your movements without the benefits of a warrant. Surveillance technology, yes, has changed the way that we can monitor people suspected of crimes, and the law hadn't quite caught up with the technology yet. The ruling is being seen as a defeat for the Obama administration that had argued that a warrant should not be needed to put a GPS on a car to monitor its movement on a public streets. And it was a victory, of course, for the ACLU, who called it an important protection of privacy. The judges ruled unanimously to uphold a precedent-setting ruling by U.S. Appeals Court that the police needed a warrant to put such a device on a suspect's vehicle. With the new technology, the government has the unprecedented ability to get mass amounts of data and store and analyze that information about a citizen's private life. Cases like this are important to privacy concerns in the new age. Now, we told you about this particular case, U.S. versus Antoine Jones, a D.C. club owner, who Maryland police secretly installed a GPS on his Jeep Cherokee back in 2005. They tracked that vehicle's movement for a month before they used all the information about his movements to convict him of conspiring to distribute cocaine. At his first trial, he was given a life sentence for cocaine trafficking. Now, an appeals court threw out his conviction, ruling that the monitoring of his car amounted to a search. All nine judges agreed with the appeals court decision today. Four of them would have gone even further, finding fault with the lengthy monitoring of Mr. Jones, saying that long-term monitoring of your vehicle's movement violate a reasonable expectation of privacy. So great news for fans of personal privacy. It it sure is. And you know what I found surprising in this unanimous decision that was authored by Justice Scalia, of all people, is that the court used the exact same logic I used in 2010 when I was describing a horrible 2010 Ninth Circuit court ruling in the case of Oregon's Juan Pinedo Romero. Now, this was a case that approved the use of a warrantless GPS device placed on the man's car while it was sitting in his driveway up on his own private property. And I, I, I painted 
painted this fantasy time machine scenario where I tried to explain to the founding fathers to imagine what it would be like if the government could put a constable in your car, put a clerk in your car to record your every movement, to record every route you took, and you would never know he was there and you'd be able to, he'd be able to report that to the government at all times. Well, in his footnote number three, Justice Scalia talks about this situ- that very situation. Uh, it posits the situation that's not far afield. A constable's concealing himself in the target's coach in order to track its movements. There is no doubt that the information gained by that trespassory activity would be the product of an unlawful search. Now, Alito kind of made fun of that, saying the constable would either have to be really small or the coach would have to be really big. But I'm glad to see the Supremes finally came down on the side of personal privacy and liberty. I personally didn't know the Supremes were still together. Yeah, yeah. Diana Ross and the Supremes just yeah. decided today you still have a Fourth Amendment. Awesome. <laughs> Let's take Thanks, a break Diana and talk Ross. about it. We're going to be right back after this. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Oh, that cough can only mean one thing, folks. You know it's coming soon. The High Times Cannabis Cup in L.A. February 11th and 12th. Me, Ganja John, Wiz Coleco, Ganja Wife, Cannabis Carry. We'll all be there. Maybe even Scott Gordon from Herbage Designs. What? What? That sounds like a fun time. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can meet all the pot stars from the normal network all at once. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Russ is now aiming the camera at me. Here we go. We'll be there February 11th and 12th. Uh, We'll probably be there all week. So if you're in the L.A. area, come hang out with us. And come to the Medical Cannabis Cup, as they're calling it. But the High Times Cannabis Cup is what we're calling it. That's right. We got the, uh, I just called the lady for the condo. Uh Uh, We got to put all the money up front, though, because it's only two weeks away. So No problem. If you got some money laying around, send it our way. Yeah, we'll figure it out. I'm working on a sponsorship. Might have uh, might have Subby sponsor our trip. There you go. And uh, you know, be brought to you by TGA. That'd yeah. be kind of cool. But uh, Danny, is Danny going out? You know? Yeah, I think so. Danny Danko, Dave Bienestock will be there. I don't know if uh, Nico's going to be there. I don't know. But uh, just about everybody who's anybody is going to be there in L.A. February 11th and 12th. Check out medcancup.com. You can get the information on tickets. And there's a VIP party as well. We'll bring that to you. Bring you we'll all be there the coverage. throughout every bit of it. Every single bit. And like the whole week before, we're going to go out to, we're going to drive down on the Monday after the Super Bowl. And then uh, we, we check into the condo on Tuesday. We get the condo from Tuesday through Sunday. Wow. It's going to be gonna a good have time. A good, good time. We'll be in Little Tokyo. Also, we're looking for volunteers to help us out with the normal booth. We need people to staff the normal booth and sell gear and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it don't pay nothing, but you get into the Cannabis Cup. So uh, if you're interested, send me an email, stash at normal.org. In all the years that we have known each other, has there been any time that I have ever given you cause or reason to suspect my sanity? Do you really want to legalize marijuana? Prove it. Join Normal today at norml.org, and your donation will help us spread the growing truth about cannabis. Free speech ain't free, you know. Free the ganja tree, it's the healing of the nation. Free, free. the Kali wheat, good for meditation. Free, free. the pot smokers, the rena delight. Free. Lighting up the chalice, they keep no malice. What's the healing marijuana? Come on, come on, come on, say, free the marijuana. Give me, give me, give me, say, free the marijuana. Come on, come on, come on, say, free the marijuana. It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420-friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. 
Today, we bring you tunes for Roots Monday, our celebration of the music that evolved into the popular modern music of today. We pick the best of blues, country, folk, and jazz with a 420 feel and serve it up for you every Monday. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. All right, we're dipping back into the reefer jazz era. This song comes to us from 1935. It's by Richard M. Jones and his jazz wizards. It's called Blue Reefer Blues. Now Richard M. Jones was from a musical family in New Orleans and played a variety of instruments before making piano his main instrument. He played in Armin Pyron's Olympia Orchestra and led his own band called the Four Hot Hounds, which included Sugar Johnny Smith and occasionally King Oliver. During World War I, he played with Papa Celestin. He left New Orleans in 1919 and moved to Chicago, where he set up the Chicago branch of Clarence Williams Publishing Company and Music Store. He played in bands in Chicago during the 1920s, but his main gig was as a manager of OK Records, Race Records Division. He led his own studio band called Richard M. Jones Jazz Wizards and accompanied a great number of singers and bands on piano. He continued to be active in music until his death, both as a musician and a talent scout. Jones is best remembered today as the composer of such jazz standards as Trouble in Mind and Riverside Blues. This is Richard M. Jones and his Jazz Wizards with Blue Reefer Blues. This is Yee from Pepper, and you're listening to The Normal Show Live. 
As High Times Senior Cultivation Editor, I'm often called into the field and asked to sample or even identify exotic strains of marijuana in their natural habitat. Now, for the first time, I've compiled more than 120 of my favorite strains into this single field guide designed to fit into your pocket as you travel the world in search of your favorite plant. From a friend's closet grow room to the wilds of Northern California, this single guide covers all of today's best known strains, plus heirlooms and throwbacks, including High Times quality photos and information on each variety's genetic heritage and growing characteristics, plus my personal notes on aroma, flavor, and potency. So this is Danny Danko, author of the official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains, wishing you good times and great ganja. The official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains is available at hightimes.com and finer bookstores. Yar! There be pirates here! Yo oh, ho ho ho! And a ton of good smoke. Har har! Do you want to legalize it? Call your congressman today. 202-224-3121. It's free, it's easy, and you don't even have to give your name. Just your zip code, and they'll hook you up to your congressman. Call 202-224-3121 and tell Congress you support marijuana legalization. Liberate your mind. Liberate your mind. Catch Normal News with Cannabis Carry every weekday on Normal Show Live at 7 p.m. Eastern here on the Normal Network. Legalization, decriminalization, lowest law enforcement priority, medical marijuana, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis, industrial hemp. The world of marijuana law reform involves many different aspects of cannabis that interact nearly every public policy discussion in America, including health care, the economy, global climate change, law enforcement and prisons, immigration, religion, free speech, energy policy, and war. Now, we take a look at how re-legalizing marijuana will change the world in our normal show live, Cannabis Conversations. All right, welcome back, everyone. And I'm thrilled to have our next guest with us, Dr. Michael J. Reznicek. He's a board-certified psychiatrist with over 20 years of experience. He's practiced in the military, community settings, prisons, and state hospitals, and currently practices as a consultant in Washington State, just north of me. Dr. Reznicek, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Russ. It's good to be here. Great to have you here. And I am so excited to get to this interview because uh, we're here to talk about your new book, Blowing Smoke, Rethinking the War on Drugs Without Prohibition and Rehab. And this speaks to me so much because I was raised, my father was a, a poly drug addict uh, up until I was about age 12. He then went to a rehab, went to a, a out counseling, uh, you know, an inpatient center, got rehab, went through 12 steps, went back to school, became a drug and alcohol counselor. So I've experienced that disease model thinking, that uh, 12-step uh, Al-Anon type thinking. And uh, now as a drug and alcohol reformer, I've found a lot of people that are beginning to question that model. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, of this disease model and how you feel it impacts our, our message and our movement to legalize marijuana. Okay. Well, I think that reformers uh, have a difficult time with legalization because they're up against people who, you know, the people who are against legalization, they're not a bunch of moral scolds. They're people who believe in science. You know, the, the medical community, the whole scientific community has come out and said, listen, drug abuse is a genetic brain disease. And so people feel comfortable trying to outlaw these drugs, even marijuana, which many consider a gateway drug. And so when we run up against opposition to legalization, it really is heavily tied into this whole disease model. And frankly, it's a bunch of junk science. And I'm, I'm embarrassed for my profession that it, it, it beats the drums of the disease model. You know, I knew when I was in medical school and in my residency training that there was a heavy ideological component to it, a heavy political component. But I just wasn't quite prepared for how big of a political component there is in this whole disease model. Yeah, there's there's a lot of industry that is, uh, you know, I've referred to it as the uh, the drug war rehab industrial complex where the we catch many, many cannabis consumers whose only problem with cannabis is getting caught with it. We sentence them to a rehab they don't really need. And when they do well coming out of that rehab, the industry says, see, rehab works. Right. Rehab can appear to work. And the reason is 
is that people who go to rehab are people who are coming out of crisis points in their life. And it's those crises that cause people to change. Now, if you take a bunch of people who are coming out of crises and you send some of them through rehab, and they're going to do better because, you know, and it's going to make it look like rehab is doing better. Now, listen, I'm, I understand, you know, rehab can be beneficial to some people, but it's not necessary and it's not what changes people. Mm. You can take you could take the top 10 addiction specialists from Harvard Medical School, sit them in front of any addict, and you tell me what they're going to do for that person. People can only change themselves, and they don't change until they're good and ready. Mm, that's the old uh, joke. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that's what it is here with uh, substance abuse. So my book, Blowing Smoke, um, what I do is I trace the history and science behind the disease model. And, and show just how disconnected from hard science it is. You know, there's two kinds of science. There's, there's empirical science, and then there's paradigm science. Empirical science is, is what researchers do. They uncover facts. Paradigm science is what scientists do. They create stories to try to explain those facts that they discover, you know, explain them to laymen. And many times, paradigms are wrong. And paradigms are particularly susceptible to being politicized. And that's what's happened. There's a there's a lot of money in this addiction treatment industry. Mm -hmm. well, but the know. truth is, the truth is, you know, I think what we ought to do, and this is, you know, a, a lot of reformers are for this. We really ought to turn back the clock. What we need to do is go back to the way drugs used to be managed prior to the late 19th century when the disease model started building steam. Basically, people were free to... Uh, consume anything they wanted, but then they had to bear the consequences for their misbehavior. Legal sanctions were limited and applied when, when your use impaired the safety or comfort level of other people, jeopardized other people's safety. Then there were legal sanctions. There's very little drama about drug abuse then. That's right. We're speaking with Dr. Michael Resnicek, MD, author of Blowing Smoke, Rethinking the War on Drugs Without Prohibition and Rehab. You can find out more about the book at his website, drrez.com. That's D-R-R-E-Z.com. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the junk science that leads people to, you know, come up with this paradigm of the addiction model or the disease model of addiction. Can you uh, go into a little detail on, on why that science is, is so incorrect and give, give us some talking points as to how we would talk to someone who's a, a proponent of this disease model? Sure. Well, one of the things that uh, neuroscience has been able to uncover is that drug use, uh, especially heavy drug use, begins to make some changes in the brain. Changes such as um, tolerance, uh, where you have to use more of a drug to get the same effect, withdrawal symptoms if you quit using abruptly after using for many years, and even craving. All of these things can be imaged in the brain. So advocates of the disease model say, ha ha, look at that. There's changes in the brain, therefore it's a disease. But listen, all habits make changes to the brain. It doesn't matter if you play a musical instrument every day, you're going to make changes to that part of the brain. If you deliver cocaine or marijuana to your brain every day, you're going to develop other changes in the brain. These are normal changes. Diseases involve abnormal changes, habits, and that's what drug abuse is, it's a habit. Habits involve normal brain changes. They're predictable and expected. You know, uh, one of the, uh, the talking points that we'll hear from the other side about the need to keep uh, drugs prohibited, marijuana prohibited, uh, is what about the children? What about the teenagers that are going to try to do drugs and they'll say, you know, prohibition keeps the price high, keeps it out of kids' hands, which we know it doesn't. But what would you uh, recommend as far as moving forward away from this disease model and this war on drugs model to address those fears? Well, you know, last time I checked, there were a lot of children using drugs already. And, and of course, we don't we should prevent that. We should have drug prohibition for children. We need to treat all drugs, I think, just like alcohol and uh, have prohibition for children. One of the one of the problems of the disease model is it tends to professionalize this problem. OK, we have law enforcement professionals who try to keep people from selling drugs and we have medical professionals who try to keep people from consuming drugs. I've had people come into my office, tell me about their spouse or their children abusing drugs or alcohol, and I ask them, well, what have you done? And they say, well, I'm not a doctor. You know, that, it's that kind of a mentality. People are disempowered. Everything has been shifted over to the professionals, 
And so if we got rid of the disease model, I'm, I'm certain people would feel empowered. We, they'd intervene much more uh, early in a, in a substance abuser's career and deliver the kinds of what I call embedded cultural controls that would actually manage the drug problem. You know, I've, I've been in these uh, rooms, I've been in these meetings, these AA type meetings, 12 step meetings where I'm a force. First, I'm always struck by the irony of the cigarette smoke and the massive amounts of coffee in these anti drug sort of places. But I, I seem to have found, at least in my opinion, that some of the people involved in these 12 step groups and in this in this ideology uh, develop almost an addiction to the rehab as much or possibly worse for them than their original use of alcohol alcohol or marijuana or other drugs. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's true. I think, you know, we all develop addictions or habits to a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the big things about the disease model is the effect it has on substance abusers. They really develop a kind of sick role mentality, a helplessness and dependency. They begin to take on the identity of a substance abuser. Mm -hmm. They only circulate and socialize with other substance abusers. And that's part of prohibition. And that's horrible. Um, but uh, I, I once had a patient who came onto my psychiatric ward from the emergency room and I looked at him and he said well my treatment hasn't worked yet and this was his 10th admission for substance abuse his treatment hadn't worked yet you know that kind of passivity and dependency mm -hmm. is, is is you know fomented by the disease model but it's complete nonsense mm -hmm. people can change themselves and and what we're talking about here and what I talk about in my book is we don't need to push abstinence that's not what we're doing we, we just need to push responsible behavior, responsible consumption. And everybody can do that. That's right. I work in the prisons and most of my patients, 95% of them were very severe addicts, but they were quitting all the time. Maybe their girlfriend told them to quit. Maybe their parents told them to quit or they ran out of money or they had some guilt about how they were living. Addicts quit all the time for various periods. Mm -hmm. You know, they typically go back, but there's just way too much drama connected with this disease model. Yeah. We're speaking with Dr. Michael Rezincheck, the author of Blowing Smoke, uh, Rethinking the War on Drugs Without Prohibition and Rehab. Again, check out the website, drrez.com, D-R-R-E-Z.com. Uh, another part of this drug war that seems you know, endemic to it, and the statistics bear it out, is the racism involved in this from the beginning of it to our current you know, NYPD statistics. Uh, any thoughts on how this disease model is intertwined with this racism? Well, you know, the roots of the disease model, as you know, and the roots of prohibition, the disease, the disease model and prohibition are very closely connected through history. But back in the temperance movement of the 19th century, you know, it was really a moral issue. You know, your body was the temple of the Holy Spirit and you shouldn't imbibe and, and ruin your body and have a spiritual violation. Then it moved to, you know, the, the whole drug war and drug, uh, drug prohibition that like Harry Anslinger was pushing at the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, this was all aimed at, at minorities and immigrants. Uh, you know, heavy, you know, and it gained steam. People like that, you know, he, he, knew, he knew how to appeal to the, to the population. But with the UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which is the legal document that most countries now use to, to wage federal drug wars, and we do too, it shifted it from race baiting to concerns about health. You know, and if you read that single convention, it's all about the disease model. It's enough to make you gag. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, as we move have moved forward in uh, drug law reform, one of the biggest successes that uh, our side points to is the 1996 Compassionate Use Act in California and the subsequent adoption of medical cannabis uh, statutes and, in some cases, constitutional amendments in now 16 states in the District of Columbia. Do you see that medical model feeding into this disease model or leading us away from it? Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, the medical uh, marijuana initiatives, these are a step in the right direction. At least they're beginning to open it up a little bit. But I do have a, a little bit of a concern about uh, some of the harm reduction movements uh, like the DPAs, where they want to take, you know, legalized drugs and get rid of all the violence of the black market. And that's true. It would do that. But take all that money we save. And Jeffrey Meyer of Harvard puts that at about $77 billion a year. Take that money and put it into more rehab, more prevention services. And I tell you, I'm a little concerned about that because of all the enabling that the disease model does. And, uh, you know, Portugal, they've made some great strides by decriminalizing everything, but they still have a heavy, huge addicted class that they're having to deal with. You know, the violent, much of the violence is gone. They have fewer substance abusers or users.
they still have a I'm sorry, we've we've lost Dr. Reznicek on our connection, but I want to thank him for joining us here on Normal Show Live, and uh, we'll be back in touch with him as soon as we can. Again, the book is Blowing Smoke, Rethinking the War on Drugs Without Prohibition and Rehab, and you can get more information on that by visiting his website at drres.com, drres.com. When we come back, hopefully Skype will be back, and we'll be speaking with Emil Visser from Normal South Africa. Be, uh, you're listening to Normal Show Live, Voice of the Marijuana Nation. Stick around. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Our marijuana laws are terribly unfair, and they make criminals out of law-abiding citizens. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges, and we are unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals. They are average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. And it's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com.
effects of marijuana prohibition are felt by all Americans in every walk of life, regardless of race, creed, color, religion, social status, wealth, gender, sexual orientation, or even one's use or non-use of marijuana. As the marijuana smokers lobby, Normal hears the stories of these average Americans and brings them to the attention of our policymakers and our fellow citizens in this segment we call Normal Newsmakers. Good morning, Russ. Oh, that's, that's like a good, good afternoon in America. How are you doing, Russ? Can you hear me, Russ? <laughs> uh, it's about 3 a.m., eh? The side. It's still dark, the side. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um... Yes. Um, just like a, I'm, I'm online for change. <laughs> We're doing a second road show in Cape Town. We, we've done, we have had a first successful roadshow in Johannesburg in December, and we're doing a screening of what if cannabis cures cancer. So I've taken the screening, and I'm taking it on a roadshow trip and featuring it at, at Nice Art Cinemas or theatres. And Thursday we're doing a screening um, what if cures, what if cannabis cures cancer, and I've got uh, dual stops of the, of the Duffer couple uh, that's busy fighting and fighting the front lines. He's going to have off now to speak. Um, I'm doing a half an hour speech as well, and the documentary is an hour. So we've got that on Thursday, and then two weeks' time, you know, the 9th of February, we've got the union as well. So we've, we're busy lining up documentaries and doing screenings, and I'm going to try and do some education on the road, see how it goes. So far, the response has been excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, for folks that want more information on this, the website for Normal South Africa is normal.org.za <laughs> or ZA, normal.org.za for more information. It's the South African Documentary Roadshow. And I'm just looking at your website right now. Very nice looking site. And excuse me for that. I've got a piece of software that refuses to die over here on the, on the other machine, but uh, keeps warning me that we can't hear you, but we can hear you just fine. So, uh, the uh, website is great, normal.org.za, and uh, the South African Road Show's up there. You can get tickets on the web uh, through webtickets.co.za, and this is the uh, second year you've done this. How was the response the yeah. first year? Um, I want to say the first year, but we had what, we had a first screening in December, and we had a we had a picnic under the stars at the jazz farm. It was an excellent evening, and we had a applauding success. So after that, I decided to come to Cape Town and set it up here. So I've been here for, for three weeks now in Cape Town and been setting up relations and getting people going and, and getting the culture in Cape Town going. And I decided to have Cape Town as a basis for the Global Marijuana March South Africa, which is the 10th annual uh, Global Marijuana March for South Africa as well. So that's the pipeline for me. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty amazing here in... Uh... Uh, there it goes again. Sorry about that. Uh, the uh, road show is showing uh, what if cannabis <laughs> cured cancer and other documentaries. Now, I, 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 the the venue here. Am I getting this right? In Cape Town, it's at the Labia Theater. <laughs> it's a very liberal theater. Yes. Okay. Um, it is. It's a very cannabis friendly theater. And they have been excellent. They've been excellent in supporting us in getting this up and running. They've given us a slot, basically every two weeks. Um, so they they will be doing a cannabis feature film or a feature documentary. And normal South people will be supporting and setting it all up. So basically, we want to have a, a national footprint of where you can go watch a documentary at your closest. Theatre or venue, and uh, the normal road show this year will go national. Oh, this is great. I mean, we've got uh, What If Cannabis Cured Cancer showing on the 26th 
of January. Uh, it's only 50 Rand for those who want to see it there at the uh, Labia Theater in Cape Town. And then on uh, February 9th, we've got The <laughs> Union, uh, the business behind Getting High showing there, also at the same theater for uh, 50 Rand. So it uh, looks, like, uh, looks like you got a lot of great shows that are coming up here. Hmm. All right. So, uh, Emil, I'm going to I'm going to uh, end the call here because we seem to have some connection problems, but I appreciate you for uh, getting up early in the morning to talk to us. And I want to encourage everyone to check out normal.org.za for the information on normal South Africa. It's got a great website, a lot of facts, good videos that are up there and uh, information for all the folks in the southern part of the African continent who want to get involved in ending uh, marijuana prohibition. This is a worldwide fight and we need chapters all over the world to make this possible. It's only going to change when the people demand it, and being a normal chapter is a large part of making that happen. Already uh, this month, I've received a request from Ireland uh, to get a, a chapter started there. Uh, we've got some requests coming from some more of the European countries as well. So we're really excited here at Normal uh, to make the international presence known. So uh, we're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we'll finish out the hour. Stick around. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Mars is the next logical step in our space program. It's the challenge that's been staring us in the face for the past 30 years. It has water. It has Music from Symphony of Science there. Welcome back. Uh, Normal Show Live. we got about a minute and a half here before we call it the end of the day. Hanging out with Ganja John here in the studios. What's up, Russ? Just chilling. Dealing with software bugs, but that's the way it goes. we got all sorts of stuff coming up on the Normal Network uh, later on tonight. It's our Texas night. On the normal network. At 6 o'clock, you get Drug Truth Network with Dean Becker from uh, Houston, Texas. You get two half hour podcasts, Century of Lies and the Cultural Baggage Show. And then at 7 o'clock, the debut of our new Texas podcast, uh, Canna Truth's Reefer Rhetoric, which is actually also two podcasts a short Canna Truth's podcast and a Reefer Rhetoric podcast. Both coming at you from Waco, Texas. Then at 8 o'clock tonight, another live edition of A Different View with Jen, Iva, and Sarah with another great guest from the Normal Women's Alliance. So check that out. Coming up later on tonight on the Normal Network. You can always find all of our schedules and uh, all the information for all the shows and the downloads for the, uh, the podcast feeds. Find those at our audio video department at normal.org slash AV. Coming up in hour two, we're going to take your calls at 971-533-7111 and talk some more about some of the stories in the news that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll talk more about that GPS decision. We'll talk about some pharmaceuticalization uh, warnings, <laughs> pharmaceuticalization warning coming uh, from GW Pharmaceuticals. And uh, my example of the local drug-free workplace. <laughs> you got to see this picture I took over the weekend. It's kind of funny. All that and more coming up on hour two here at Toker Talk Radio. For Ganja John and Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a 
You're really clouding the energy.